Hello and welcome to the EDH RecCast, where we're all about commander data and dad jokes. My name is Joey Schultz and I'm joined by my fantastic co-hosts. Up first, he kind of can't get over the fact that the new Tom Bombadil card is dressed exactly like Paddington Bear. It's Matt Morgan. Joey, did you know, well, I guess the question is, do you know why hobbits are the best gardeners? Uh, there's a hairy feet joke in here somewhere, I'm sure. Gross. No, it's because they're the only ones that can use photosynthesis. Ah, science. Ah, science. <laughs> yes. Uh, science indeed. All right. I I don't know how to react to that one. We're just going to move on. Up next. Just get to Dana. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He just cast a you cannot pass spell and promptly found himself unable to pass the turn. It's Dana Roach. I'm kind of disappointed in all of these Hobbit jokes. They are really good people. They don't look down on anybody. And I don't know how you guys can uh, make fun of them like this. I, so are, is your temper a little short when it comes to Hobbit jokes? Yeah, yes, yes. Oh, my goodness. Y'all are absolutely ridiculous. And I know that you're really excited for the upcoming <laughs> Lord of the Rings set. But for absolutely for this episode, though, Matt, what are we talking about in this podcast episode right here? This week, we are going to talk about how we would build decks for newer players, people just getting into the game, building their first decks, or they just need help building a deck. What's that process look like? And we should quick shout out that this was suggested to us by, by Jason Vickery of uh, Beetle and Grimm, who we just played some games with on our stream at twitch.tv slash EDHRECcast. Yes, yes, indeed. Great shout out. But I regret to inform you that, Matt, you are incorrect about the topic of the show. The first thing we're actually going to do is challenge the stats, okay? Because I need to segue into the podcast segments one of these days. I am desperate. <laughs> you don't... <laughs> I wow! <laughs> I didn't talk to the manager. You you haven't even started the show, so you can't challenge. I was not ready for that. Well, I was oh not prepared for that. They have stolen my segue into challenge stats every day this year. I'm getting one of them. No, it's okay. We can actually put it to the halfway point as usual. But I needed to get my segue in one. Of, I was having withdrawals. Okay, you guys. <laughs> That's fair, Matt. I hope you're proud of me. I'm sipping very disappointed tea in your direction. <laughs> <laughs> All right, real talk. The actual thing that we're going to start off is with some quick shout outs before we get to our main topic. First, we'd like to thank Chase, also known as Manic Curves, for help with editing the show. You can find them on Twitter at Manic Curves. EDH Rec has partnered with Coalesce Apparel and Design, makers of the best magic merch you'll ever find. Use code EDH Rec for 10% off any order at Coalesce. Their apparel is slick and stylish. We, of course, recommend the EDH Rec collection. And there are tons of others you can check out, like their new Riptide project or their Keeping It 100 collections, too, with really fun designs. So once again, that's code EDH Rec for 10% off your order. And if you'd like to support the show, you can do so by liking and subscribing this video on YouTube, subscribing on your local podcast apps, or by going to patreon.com slash EDH RecCast. We have patron tiers of all levels. Whatever you want to get, it's just a nice way to get yourself a little perk back for supporting the show and it has the very special weekly shout out and this week that patron shout out is going to go to levi stevenson so levi i know that you're an iowa state football fan and that's very disappointing to me being from kansas <laughs> but we do appreciate the support and i do support your your podcasting as well so if you like some college sports podcasting you can check out levi i guess but <laughs> levi stevenson thank you even though you're an Iowa State fan. Wow, I, I did not see that coming. It got personal this week. The shout out got personal. Yeah, that's absolutely ludicrous. I love it. Okay, let's get into <laughs> our actual topic here about building decks for new players, things to do, things to avoid, crafting experiences for people who are a little bit newer to the game of EDH. And Dana, I guess, um, let, let's put the ball in your court to start. When it comes to, actually, the reason I want to do this is because Recently on the show, you mentioned having a an elf deck that you build for new players that sometimes it like you'll just be like, yeah, you can keep it um, because it's a, a cheap deck for you to throw together and it's fun to play against new folks. And I guess I wanted to interrogate that a little bit. So let's uh, put the ball into your court when it comes to how you built that deck and why and things that went into it, I guess. Yeah, so, so I've had th probably three different sets of experiences in the last, uh, say, year or so regarding this. Um, 
So you know, my son has kind of got into playing a little bit. So I, I put a, a Robo Cat deck together for him and let him pick what he wanted to build. And he he liked that theme. He likes animals. So so we built we built a cat deck there. And then I had built that that Marwin the Nurturer deck that was supposed to be like I said one that I could give to a new player and just let them keep after they played it. And then um, I, I put one together for a friend of mine as well. I, I think I put it on stream a, a blue black fairies deck who was also relatively new to the game. Hmm. So I, I I had three different like kind of similar audiences that I built three different decks for roughly in the last year. Um, and one of the first things I did after I built the deck was, was play the decks myself and then let them play it. And, and the, the difference in experiences in, in me playing, particularly the first draft of those decks, because I built them roughly at the same time, how they played for me and how they played for a relatively new player to the game were very, very different things. And that was <laughs> um, a, a quite an eye-opening experience, I would say. Have you noticed that maybe a newer player is less willing to play stuff like Knight's Whisper, <laughs> losing life to draw cards, which is one sure. of your favorite cards ever? Yes. Like, with experience, you know the value of losing life to draw cards, but to a new player, it's not immediately obvious. So yeah, those little things crop up. There's probably a broad category of things that there that we could all lump in together. Losing a life to accomplish a thing is definitely one that is not intuitive at all to new players. The other one that really jumped out at me that's kind of a similar is is in the Arabo deck I built for my son is sacrificing creatures. Mm. Um, so particularly one of the things green does is it has multiple ways that you can sacrifice a creature and draw cards and, and oftentimes also gain life equal to that creature's power. And in that Arabo deck, there's a bunch of like small cats, but Arabo has ability, his, his ability is to pump those cats up. So like you can attack someone with this, this relatively innocuous creature and pump it up multiple times to do a good bit, bit of damage. And then that doesn't feel bad to sacrifice that creature in your second main phase after you've pumped it up, you know, to draw eight or 10 cards, unless you're a new player. <laughs> then like that, that I discovered when, when he was playing that deck, the thing that felt super powerful to me was something he did ne he never wanted to do. Mm. He did not want to sacrifice those creatures to draw a bunch of cards because that felt like a, a, a net lost to him that that was very unintuitive and felt very strange and the same thing applies to like losing life to draw cards as well new players i found really don't like something that feels like a negative even if the positive might outweigh it well yeah there's there's so many of those new player misconceptions and maybe not misconceptions but the the hurdles that you mentally you have to get over when you're getting into the game i remember when i first started playing was right around return ravnica it was Oh, these these twenty dollar lands, like you have to pay two life for them to come in untapped. Like that doesn't make any <laughs> sense. That's that's stupid. <laughs> and so it took a while, admittedly, to kind of get over that because when I first was playing as a kid, there were no the shock lands that didn't make it. We also were playing unsleeved on the concrete like all the heathens. But <laughs> sure. yeah, there, there there are so many things that just seem counterintuitive. Like I I put effort into putting this creature on the battlefield. Why would I want to sacrifice it? Why would I want to pay life? to have this land come in and tapped when I can just play a basic. There's a whole lot of those different things that you just have to mentally get over as you're kind of getting more and more exposed as a, as a new time player. Mm. And what I found was the most effective way to, to, to deal with that too um, was, was not to not do any of it, but just to like put one of those effects maybe in the deck. Uh, you you know the newer player who was playing that fairies deck for example really did not like the the sign and blood and the knight's whisper and the read the bones and the you know singing study or something all in the deck the, there was half a dozen different things that drew you cards and, and, and cost you life in the process but if there's just one of them like just the one sign and blood that occasionally they use that is what I found was most effective if if they put one of those things in there so they could like get a taste for it but didn't feel like they were being overwhelmed with this one negative effect so. Occasionally, I can lose life to draw cards. Or occasionally, I will sacrifice a creature versus doing it a bunch of times, even if doing it a bunch of times might be better, not overwhelming them with all of those negative choices I found it was kind of the way to ease them into getting used to doing that. That's a really great observation. The word overwhelm, I think, might come up a couple more times in this podcast. Because, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, a new player dealing with a hundred cards. Like, I mean, I know that we've all reached that point in our deck building where we feel like a hundred cards is too restricting because there's so much that we want to put into right. a deck. <laughs> but initially, when you're handed a pile of 100 unique cards, you're like, ugh. And then it gets even 
worse, worse in air quotes, because you're also dealing with the hundred other cards of each respective opponent's deck. Like the battlefield is messy and complicated and way so much to take in all at once. So I definitely find a thing that I want to do whenever I'm building or teaching a new player um, whenever I'm building for or teaching a new player, I don't build new players. All right, gotta watch my words. <laughs> um, but it, it is definitely a a bringing things back down to basics and keeping things basically as simple as possible. And having things uh, ironed down to small concepts definitely helps a lot. Like Danny, you mentioned that cat deck or that fairies deck. I find that like the simplicity of this is a deck full of dragons. This is a deck that cares about lands. You play land and you make a thing off of rampaging bailout like things like that these are straightforward concepts that also are extremely exciting and so having the excitement and the simplicity can really help narrow things in and uh, allow greater focus for that player yeah again joe just don't overwhelm them one thing that i would highly highly recommend to folks when they're explaining how to play to to new players is don't overwhelm them. And, and one way to do that is just keep everything on board. There's a lot to keep track of. And so telling a new player to watch out for things that are still in the hands instead of things they can't actively track and see on the battlefield, that's a huge way to, to take advantage of just, okay, this is what you got to worry about. The things that are here, don't worry about what's in their hand because that's just a more advanced concept. And so keeping things on the battlefield, that's what they have to focus on just so that there's there's not too much they have to process and kind of think about in the back of their head. That's going to allow newer players just to kind of process and kind of, you're not throwing them in the deep end, handing them a combo deck. You're, you're saying, okay, like we're going to do things pretty straightforward and keeping things on the battlefield, just sorcery speed even. Yes. That is going to, there's a reason that Hearthstone is so much more accessible than Magic for, for people just casually playing because pretty much everything happens at sorcery speed. That's one thing that just will help people get into the game is keep things sorcery speed. Don't worry about counter spells, whatever. That's just going to overwhelm people. I I really like that point about instance. I like the stack is easily one of the most complicated things to <laughs> teach players yeah. about yep. this dang game. Like and and I think we can all remember those confusions that we had entering into magic. Like you don't know can I attack only players or can I attack creatures when they're tapped? Like these are questions that genuinely came up for all of us because we didn't know the rules that seem obvious to us and you know in retrospect but like things about instance it is in a way more advanced version of that so if you are going to include any instance in a deck matt i totally agree something like counter spells players might be a little confused about what are the type of spells i should counter mm -hmm. and if i do include any instance in a deck it tends to be more of like I'll use the card Inspiring Call as an example here, something that straightforwardly gives your stuff indestructible. That is an instant that makes itself extremely obvious when it is optimal to cast because it's like, oh, is my stuff going to die? Instead, it doesn't. And you don't, like the player holding that card doesn't have questions about when am I supposed to use this? It becomes a little bit more obvious because the card is so much more straightforward. Well, in Inspiring Call is a, kind of a perfect example of a card too because it, it kind of scales in complexity. You can give that to a new player and they can be like, oh, this draws me a couple of cards and makes myself indestructible, so I'm going to cast this in attack, and this is going to be this, this useful card I have that I, it lets me swing out and my stuff doesn't die. But then there's the added layer that, or, or you, can, <laughs> you can use it at, at instant speed in response to someone trying to blow up your thing. But like, they don't need to think the card still works before they get to that level. Mm -hmm. It's still going to be an effective card they can use just as an offensive tool. And then as they get better at the game and start seeing more of the board, it also has the ability to use it defensively. And like, so it's, it's going to scale with their ability to play the game. And that's a really useful thing, I think, to, to put in a deck. Well, and even if you're going to put instants in there, make them the type that they're not going to be bad if you play them at sorcery speed. Right, Stuff, right. Yeah. Like, like, like a single target removal, like swords to plowshares. Okay, this thing's scary. I can get rid of it, right? Okay, I'll do that. It, it doesn't matter as much if it's main phase or instant speed, whatever's going on. So th there's certain types of cards and, and you'll kind of get a feel for that the more that you get exposed to the game. But you'll see, is this a good, good card for a new player to try and figure out? Probably not. Mm -hmm. And so just weeding out those things, just reducing the decision trees, that's going to be the biggest thing is just... I. 
the three of us have been playing for forever, and I still get decision paralysis trying to figure out what I'm going to do on my turn, much less right. <laughs> handing me a deck that I've never played before. And so that's definitely a real thing is just don't overwhelm folks with all the decisions that they can make. Just give them something that's going to almost not quite pilot it, the pilot itself, but they're going to have the minimal amount of decision trees to make just to get through a simple turn. Another thing that I definitely notice myself wanting to avoid in decks that I build that a new player is going to pilot is excessive shuffling. Yeah. <laughs> like tutors in general are an absolute no go. Like I know that people want demonic tutor to get more reprints because that card shouldn't be as expensive as it is. But like I have occasionally seen on the onlines that people are like, why don't they put these into precons? And I'm like, you should know why they don't put these into precons. <laughs> Searching you your should deck not for- make that decision. Right. Don't put that onto a person who's just picked this up. They have no idea what they're gonna go searching for and that honestly also goes for even simple land searching effects sometimes too like a fetch land some arid mesa into a temple garden situation is an absolutely great synergy especially if you're playing like some type of landfall deck or something like that but a new player doesn't know what the optimal thing is to, to get for that. They just see that they lose a life and then they have to spend a lot of time shuffling and they didn't know that they were supposed to get this dual type land. Lands can have two types. Like that's all a lot of information to process. And you're just putting this loading screen into the game whenever you're having to shuffle the deck a whole lot. So I'll, I'll sometimes, you know, Arcane Signet is a much more straightforward ramp advantage spell than some of the other land searchers out there. And that sometimes is a thing that I take into consideration when making a deck that I know a new player is going to be handling. Well, and one thing that I, I kind of feel bad that we didn't kind of lead off with almost is when you're helping somebody build their own deck, ask them questions, ask mm. what they like to do. Because one thing that I know I tend to do is I, I have a personal preference. Joey, Dana, you both have personal preference. We, we all have certain things that we like to do ourselves with the game. And so one thing that's going to help us get away from that is just asking the new person questions about, okay, so you, you've played Dominion. That's another deck building game. What types of decks do you like to build in that or, or other games? What do you like to do? What's a, a play style you like? And the more questions you ask somebody, that's going to help you understand, okay, what's going to be a good color combination? What's going to be a good commander to give them? What's a strategy they could explore first mm. just to get exposure and, and have those corollaries where you're going to, okay, I know this kind of th a strategy. I'm good at that. I enjoy doing that. So I'm going to give them this type of deck. That's one thing. Just you're going to help make that connection. You're not going to give them. If you gave me one of Joey's reanimator decks, <laughs> A, I no, but B, <laughs> I, I, I might struggle with that just trying to, to go along. And so if you give it to somebody who doesn't enjoy that type of strategy, sure. you may just lose them all together. So asking questions, just discover what that person likes, that's going to help you so much in the discovery process. Yeah, the, it, it's kind of the, the the talking about people not liking to, to lose life or sacrifice creatures or whatever. The reason they don't like those things is because they want to have, have a healthy life total and they want to play cool creatures. They don't want to lose those creatures. Well, so give them cool creatures, right? <laughs> <laughs> give them something that they can, that they can see that, that, great powerful dragon with fantastic art that's going to do a neat thing that you can put into play and feel like they are doing something impactful that feels really good like that there's a reason they don't want to sacrifice that cool dragon or even that that smaller innocuous cat because they want to play those things and do something with them so lean into that and you talked about asking what they want a lot of times They'll they'll be much more inspired by some kind of a cohesive themed deck, whether it's you know a, a cat deck or a dragon deck or whatever, something built around a, a particular creature type theme, or a, a deck that's just doing something that's recognizable and understandable. I think you definitely run the risk of getting in the weeds with too much complexity sometimes with themes, but you don't have to. You can still build something kind of clear and understandable that gives them something mentally to latch onto. Oh, this is an elf deck. I'm playing a bunch of elves that are going to do this particular thing. That's an easy thing to grasp onto. And then they can like enjoy having fun with turning those elves sideways and swinging in or whatever. So I think that's, that, that, that's, two things kind of tied in together there, Matt, the, mm -hmm. the ask them questions, find out what they like, and then give them what they want, generally speaking, which is to play those powerful, fun creatures. But yeah, like if they want to play big, dumb creatures, 
give them a deck that has Terrastodon in it. Because that is one of the <laughs> biggest, just yeah. gnarliest, cool things that for a new player to see. It's like, oh, this big friggin' dinosaur that blows things up. Or if they, they're they like, oh, I like to be sneaky and I, you know, stealthy about that. Give them a Demir Anawan deck that has all the rogues and they can be stealthy and evasive. Mm. There's all sorts of different things that you can just kind of... A, you find out what they want. And then like Dana said, give them what they want. Don't don't say, oh, you like to turn things sideways. I'm going to give you a spell slinger deck. No. <laughs> and there's so many options, people. You can find something that's going to fall in line with what new people want to do. And it is like further complicated, I think. Like I was teaching a, a new player who really enjoys, um, who, who plays D&D a lot and who really enjoys necromancy as a, and I was just like, that resonates with me. I've got plenty of, of decks that do lots of reanimation and stuff. But actually finding a deck that was like actually good for this player to learn, it, it, it was a little bit tougher because, you know, Will Health involves sacrificing a bunch of stuff. And there's a lot of reanimation that I have in my Will Health deck, but zombies really didn't make a whole lot of sense for the way that this person played so that is actually kind of what inspired me to make that vohar reanimator deck that i've played with you guys on stream because that is a much more straightforward version of reanimation it's mm -hmm. just like a thing's in the graveyard i bring it right back out as opposed to will health which is like plenty of reanimation is in that deck it's true but it also involves dana as you mentioned a lot of sacrificing of creatures so even though i did find a graveyard deck for a person who thematically wanted to play around graveyards i didn't find one that actually had any adhesion or cohesion that resonated with that player and that took a little bit of trial and error before i actually finally was able to find something that worked out and yeah it's just it, sometimes that is a little bit tougher because you might know oh i want to play graveyards or i like artifacts a lot but there are different avenues into each of those themes and so that is also worth digging into a little bit to make sure that you found the right way that that particular theme speaks to that player and particularly with a new player you know they probably don't know much about the game and maybe they will just instinctively know oh dragons sound cool <laughs> but if they don't let them look at some cards mm -hmm. uh, the reason i wound up building demir um, fairies for my friend who had built the deck for was because um, I let her look through a bunch of my cards, and and she, I, I was not expecting her to pick that. But she's like, "Why do all these fairies look kind of evil?" <laughs> I was like, oh, "Well, they kind of are, I guess, on the particular plane they come from. They are, you know, they're not like nice Tinkerbell esque fairies for the most part. Most fairies and magic are kind of mischievous, if not outright evil." And she's like, "I kind of like the art on all of these fairy cards. I, I'm, I'm into the, this kind of." kind of cruel insect looking fairies. I'm like, all right, there we go. I wouldn't have thought that, but like that was something that resonated with her. That, that's a relatively easy thing to do is just give the, the person some cards, let them take a look and see what they connect with. The art makes a difference a lot of times. Dana, that's a point that resonates with me because when I was teaching my cousin to play, it kind of came down to the same thing. Matt, you'll love this. Uh, eventually, the the thing that resonated with her most was Omnath of Rage because it was a bunch of angry jelly beans and she really wanted to throw a bunch of angry jelly beans at people. Yeah. And like that was the sticking point. That was the cohesion that suddenly made her really delight in, in what the game was happening. And then it, she proceeded to stomp on all of her faces because it was, <laughs> it was a really fun time. But like... Like the joy didn't just come from the gameplay. The joy came from the art and the thematicism, like you were pointing out. <laughs> I mean, I, I can appreciate your cousin, A, liking Angry Omnath, but also B, resonating with taking the segue to challenge the stats because that's something that certainly we can all appreciate. So uh, for, for the sake of your cousin, give, give her a hug for me. But also thanks for letting me steal the segue into challenging the stats where we think stats are higher or lower, whatever it is Joey says. <laughs> But here we're going to challenge stats. It's been so long since I've done the segue. You can't even remember my usual segue spiel. I can't. You're, you're right. I can't. Oh, you brilliant mastermind. I hate and love you. Th this is where we have the old lady from Titanic saying it's been 84 <laughs> years since Joey got to do the segue. <laughs> She's so kind and old, but she remembers for you, Joey. Oh, no. I'm going to throw Matt into the ocean along with the heart of the ocean. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> Let's, let's let's take a break and I'll find my dignity soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were talking about paying life to draw cards earlier. And, and one of my favorite cards in recent years is Stinging Study, which is a five mana instant. You draw cards and lose life equal to the mana value of your commander. Um, I tend to run in, in decks that have a higher CMC commander, four, five, six mana, because spending five mana to draw that many cards is a pretty good trade off most of the time. 
but it doesn't do you much good if you've got like a two mana value commander or a three mana value commander. Um, feels less impactful for, for paying that much mana. Um, but saying study is worth noting. It's in 25,000 decks, almost 26,000. One card that is also black, that also costs five mana, is Necrologia that's only in under 7,000 decks, 6,888 rec. Ne Necrologia, pay um, X life and draw X cards. That's it. You can only play it during your end step. So it's a um, instant spell. It's not as quite as flexible as seeing study where you can wait and see if you need to use your mana for something else and b before the end of the turn, draw a few cards. But similar effect, you're spending five mana, same as singing study, and as much life as you want to pay, and, and you're oftentimes paying five or six with singing study, same thing, draw the same amount of cards. Um, like I said, it's not quite as flexible, but for being able to basically draw the same amount in decks that really don't want to be drawing singing study, it's a pretty efficient draw spell to the point where I do think if Singing Study is in that many decks, Necrologia should be in more than the quarter of the amount of Singing Study. So um, take a look at it if you like that effect, like doing that kind of thing in black, but don't have a commander that supports Singing Study, Necrologia is a pretty solid card. Oh my goodness, this card is bonkers in like Shield of the Apocalypse or Quasa Augur of Agonies. Right, where where it, it winds up putting you life ahead. What? And it's only in 20% of Quasa decks and 25% of Shieldra decks? And like, yeah. you, oh my, that's, oh. And, and it hasn't had a reprint in a while. It's probably a card where people just don't even know it's a card that exists, so. I would say it, it's pretty seasoned and it's yeah. the, se the time it's been around. Wow, that's an absolutely wild one, Dana. I like it a lot. All right, I'll move to my challenge here. And this is actually our listener submitted challenge, the stats of the week, which comes to us via email from one Nick Comp, who has a very cool challenge for Miram Sentinel Worm decks. And it stars the card Cryptic Gateway, which is a card that I have absolutely looked at and wanted to make work before. And I've never been able to justify it, but I think that Nick has found a very good reason to play it in a Miram deck. Cryptic Gateway is the five mana artifact that says you can tap two untapped creatures you control and you may put a creature card from your hand into play that shares a creature type with each creature tapped this way. So this would be a great deck, uh, a great card for things that are built around a specific creature type, but also usually a lot of those things like elves and zombies or goblins or stuff like that are cheap enough that you're not going to want to take a speed bump on a card like this that will take a whole turn just so you can start cheating stuff into play. Like you'd want to play this in a deck that has high cost stuff. But if you're playing high cost stuff, then tapping them is a big ask. So it's kind of a card that's never really justified itself to me in a lot of decks. But Nick points out a synergy with Miram Sentinel Worm here that is actually kind of nutso. Like, Miram Sentinel Worm is that team or dragon that gives you another copy of every dragon that you play. So with Miram in play and with the gateway, every time that you use this ability to cheat a dragon into play, you have two dragons. And now you can tap both of those to play for free another dragon. And as Nick points out in the email that he sent us, um, you can also potentially in that deck play a lot of cards like Garrick's Uprising and Tamer Ascendancy and a lot of other draw spells like that that um, will just make you refill your hand as you're going. Mira might be like the one most amazing case for Cryptic Gateway that I've ever seen. And Nick points out that this has won him quite a big number of games ever since you tried it. It does seem like a win more card in a lot of places, but Mira might be one of the places that is best suited for this very strange card. It also just got reprinted in Dominaria Remastered. If folks want to make their already amazing Miram decks even more spicy, this is definitely worth a look. And it's currently showing up in only like 200 out of the 11,000 Miram decks out there. This is a cool sleeper pick. I think it's absolutely fantastic to bring that forward. Thank you so much for that challenge. Yeah, Mir Miram decks go burr, but finding new ways for it to go burr, that's actually kind of hard to do. So well well played there. Uh, so I'll wrap it up then with my challenge, uh, which is going to be for Glissa Sunslayer deck. So it's, it's a new one from Phyrexia All Will Be One. Dana, I know that you've switched your old Glissa into the new Glissa. So I'm curious to see what you're going to uh, say about this challenge. So the new Glissa Sunslayer. So there's a lot of different things going on. Some people are doing elf decks with this. Some people are doing sagas. Some people are doing it just straight enchantress. So there's all sorts of different strategies that are kind of coming into the typical, well, if you look at the page for Glissa Sunslayer, it's all over the place. There's just a whole bunch of different strategies. But I do really, really like 
that they're people are playing around with sagas. They're they're putting any saga that you can into the new Glissa uh, sagas. They're the enchantments that age up or however they. they get new chapters and you get new effects every time it goes to a new chapter. So there's a lot of cool things going on there and they're getting a lot of really cool synergies. You're playing, seeing stuff like Thrill Parasite, Hex Parasite, Pharopede, which I didn't even know was a real card until I was looking at Gliss's page. <laughs> so there's a lot of really cool things that are going to manipulate the, the page counters or whatever the counters are, the saga chapters on all your different sagas. One card that I'm not super sold on just because it's a one-time effect versus a lot of the other effects that you have where they're repeatable is going to be Vampire Hexmage. So Vampire Hexmage is black black for a Vampire Shaman. so a 2-1 with first strike that you can sacrifice Vampire Hexmage to remove all counters from target permanents, which means you could sa sacrifice Vampire Hexmage to reset one of your sagas and then it starts over and you get all the effects all over again. But for all the other cool cards that you're playing in the Saga-focused decks, the stuff like Power Conduit, which you can remove a counter from a permanent you control to put a charge counter on an artifact, or put a plus one, plus one counter on a creature, there's so many cool little cards that you're playing in the Saga-focused Glissa decks that Vampire Hexmage, to me, is kind of underwhelming. It's it, it, You only get to use it once. It's not a card you... If you're sacrificing it and you're playing regrowth effects, you're probably not going to want to regrowth your Vampire Hex Mage. You're just going to want to regrowth the Powerful Saga all over again, or maybe the Verdure and Enchantress so you can keep drawing cards whenever you cast more Sagas. I just, I don't know if that's the type of card that you want to make room for. 30% of Glissa decks are, are doing that, which is pretty high when you consider that not all of the decks on Glissa's page are, are doing the Saga strategy. So it's probably higher when you look at Saga-specific decks. So there's all sorts of different other ways you can do that. Uh, Thief of Blood, Joey, I know is one that you're very, very in love with. Uh, hey. It removes all counters from all permanents. There's a lot of really cool ways you can do it en masse, but... Vampire Hex Mage to me, it's just, it's not worth the card when you're already doing that with so many other strategies that are repeatable. So if you're playing Glissa Sagas, maybe take Vampire Hex Mage out of your decks. If you're playing it with Dark Depths, then by all means, go ahead. But yeah, but yeah <laughs> for, for sure there. But um, a, a two card combo does not a deck make. Yeah, I would actually kind of, I, I would almost say like to, I guess to add on or like, in my opinion, a lateral move or something for that challenge would also be like Ether Snap could also be another thing worth taking a look at. Yeah, yep. um, That's the five mana source to remo remove all counters from all permanents and exile all tokens. And like my criticism there with the sagas is that a lot of the sagas make tokens and put counters on things for you. So if you cast an Ether Snap, you are resetting the saga, but you're also getting rid of the token and all of the counters that it gave to you. So like that would almost be one like and you can't even recur that one. So that one is the one that I give a little bit of side eye to. Yeah, there, there's a lot of collateral damage with either snap that I, I'm not a huge fan of. Yeah, which is a shame because I want to like that card. But Matt, as you pointed out, I like Thief of Blood just a little bit more. That's probably your your de jour, your pick de jour, whatever. <laughs> Alrighty, let's get ourselves back into our topic, talking about things that we do and that we don't do when creating experiences for new players in EDH. And a big one, a big one that I want to throw in here that like, I mean, we mentioned keeping it simple in the first part of the show, but I really want to reiterate it here is like making sure to avoid, for example, cards that have keywords without descriptions on them or like Eesh. cool rules tricks that are cool for an experienced player are just going to be very confusing for a new player. Um, so just try and tamper those down. And this can be tricky. Like when I was building a deck for a new player, I had a copy of Skyhunter Strike Force, which is a really neat card that gives all of your stuff the melee ability, which, you know, buffs up all of your stuff if you attack multiple opponents. And I was like, this, I think, would be a pretty straightforward card. This is kind of neat and it encourages a nice aggressive pattern. It's a, a, a neat card. Once you have your commander in play, get stuff on board. It's exciting. The problem was that I had the full art version of that card and it does not explain what the melee keyword does. <laughs> and like, <laughs> that's just going to cause a lot of questions for new players. So like, that's another small way that these cards can sometimes crop up is just like, keep, keep things simple. Even the word flying is, can be confusing. Even the word trample is already a lot to learn. Throwing a bunch of other keywords in there too is very distracting when everything is coming at you all at once. Yeah, that, that's definitely an, an easy thing to to mess up as an experienced player as well. Um, you take for granted how a lot of these things work, and you don't need the text to remind you what how that keyword functions. New players, this is, I mean, it's Greek to them. They're, they're, it's a functionally a foreign language when they start seeing some of these keyword pop-up on cards. Um, 
And even when they're explained, it's challenging sometimes, let alone when it doesn't have any explanation. Guys, I, I am legit not kidding about this. And I feel like people are going to listen to me right here and think that I am lying or that I am exaggerating about this. I am not. I legit once met someone in a game store who had a deck that they said was for new players. And I am not joking about this. It was a Tassier combo deck and the deck contained cards such as the textless version of Cryptic Command. <laughs> huh. I, that, that memory haunts me. It sticks. I I lurch upright in bed, screaming, thinking about that because I was just like, no, all of that is not. It's just. It was a, a good example of what not to do. I'm gonna challenge the stats on them saying that's a new player friendly, right? Because <laughs> that doesn't make sense. A cryptic command is one of. You can have like Hall of Fame level competitive players <laughs> that don't play cryptic command well. And so giving a textless version of that <laughs> to a new player that uh, I, I would question that person. Matt, pop quiz. What are all the modes of cryptic command? Do you know I'm off the top of your head? Counter target spell draw a card. <laughs> not just the modes, the sequence of the modes on the card is relevant and how they resolve. Uh -huh. So not only do you do you need to know the modes, you need to know what order they're listed on the Counter -target card. Counter target spell draw a card. That's all the cards. That's, that's, that's all. all that's all. Like there's, there's, a, there's a tap all creatures mode, I think, isn't there? If you've played in a PTQ, which they don't exist anymore, so you probably haven't. <laughs> but if you played in a PTQ back in the day, you would know cryptic command only says counter target spell draw a card <laughs> draw a card yeah yeah oh my god everyone watching the youtube version of this comment below with what cryptic command does wrong answers only also while you're there questing beast right yeah. <laughs> but yeah that is i think like a really big example that's easy for me to point to but there are other small ways that this can manifest too and like cool tricks that we're proud of as deck builders are the kind of things that we'll put into our own decks but in the hands of someone who's a little bit less familiar it won't be obvious like the card reconnaissance i think is another great example here mm -hmm. and that's a card that i've put into some of my decks before that's the really nifty white enchantment that lets you untap your creatures. But the reminder text on the card is actually a lie. Given the way that the rules have changed since that card was printed and it's never had an updated printing, it says that the creature wouldn't deal combat damage when you remove it from combat and untap it. But you can actually activate that effect in the end of combat step after damage has been dealt and untap your creature and basically give it a pseudo form of vigilance. E even knowing the rules of this game, that card is confusing, you know, and it'd be a card that I'm proud to play in my deck. But if I have that card in my deck, I'm probably going to take it out before I give that deck to a new player. Well, and I would even take that piece of advice, Joey, and, and take it a step further. I would dare even say, don't put too many of your own pet cards in the, the deck for the new player. Mm -hmm. So if you're helping somebody build their deck for the first time, don't don't suggest all these cards that you know and love and just say, oh, I swear it's good. I, I it's Just trust me, it's, it's a good card. <laughs> we, we talk on the show all the time about the, the cards that, Dana especially, the cards that seem to be super good when somebody else plays it, but when you put it in your own deck, it is super underwhelming and disappointing, and then you put it back in a box for disappointing you. <laughs> the, there are cards like that all the time. So don't, if you're helping somebody build their own deck for the very, very first time, Again, all the things that we've said kind of culminate in, into one point of just don't tell people to play so all these cards that you find very, very good that maybe are a little more specific to things that just the way that you tend to play. Well, I, a good example of that, I think at this point, I would I would almost say that Liquid Metal Torque is, I don't know if I'd call it a pet card, but it's a card that we all love. Yeah. There's probably yeah. very few cards in the last couple of years that we as a group like more than Liquid Metal Torque. And it seems relatively straightforward. It is not at all. And that's one I discovered in that fairy deck that I put in there that I, I assumed would be, oh, that's it's a mana rock and you can turn things into artifact and that's self-explanatory. It was very complicated for the two different newer players to try to play that deck. They did not know what it was doing or, or why, I want, why do I want to turn stuff into artifacts? What can I do with that? I'm like, well, I'll try to explain to you, you know, if you have a removal spell that can hit artifacts or something else blows up all artifacts, you can... Like I don't that doesn't make any sense. I don't understand. So is it no longer the thing that it is? Mm -hmm, There's right. just a lot of questions that that card opens up that that seems easy to a player like us, and and we all love that card. But the reasons we love that card are the reasons it's difficult for a new player to use. Right. I have this Urborg. Does the Urborg tap for mana? It doesn't say so on the card. Yeah. 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 And I can already see a bunch of comments on the YouTube video of people saying, "Oh, Liquid Metal Torque. It's super easy once you understand the rules." But again, we're, we're talking about people who don't necessarily understand all the rules yet. This is for people that are just getting into the game. And chances are, if you're watching this podcast, 
you might be helping people build decks, but you're probably not in, you're, you're probably super invested. You've already built your own decks. So if you're the person that's new trying to figure out how to build your own deck, like you probably aren't listening to this cause you just, you're not into the game that much. I, I'm not theory crafting that one. Like I've never seen a new player try to use cryptic command. I'm assuming it's probably challenging <laughs> a textless cryptic command for a new player. My assumption is that's hard, but I guess I've never witnessed it. I've witnessed people trying to like use liquid metal torque and it is a difficult thing to grok for a newer player for sure. Yeah. So like that's that I'm not just guessing on that one. I've seen it. Yeah. Expecting new players to pick up on all the things you can do when you're changing card types. That's just, mm -hmm. it's one of the, it, it's something that they'll pick up with time, obviously, because we, a lot of people that would be listening to the show are like, oh yeah, that makes sense. But we're also very invested. We understand some of those more in, intensive rules interactions, like changing card types. Very similar, Matt, to saying like, don't play your own pet cards is be aware of when you're perhaps inadvertently forcing your own pet style onto someone too. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, and th that often manifests in the form of the cards you suggest. But like, I, I tend to be kind of a reckless player in terms of how many, <laughs> how I treat my life total and how many basic lands I will be willing to run in a deck. Like I'm aware of that, but like that's, that's something I intentionally, or I'm aware that I tend to do in my decks. My my instinct when I was brewing up for a few of these decks early on was to like brew them how I would normally brew a deck, and that's def that's also something challenging for a new player to try to play with a style that perhaps might not be their style, um, and it's difficult to play with if you aren't using to play. You're not used to playing that way. Yeah, I mean, just letting letting players make the decisions of what cards finally go into those decks as they're learning how to build. Just just let them pick the bad cards. And let them have that learning experience of, mm -hmm. okay, I like this card, I want to play this, but uh, it's, it's actually not very good. It, it never really succeeded for me. Mm -hmm. Let them have those learning experiences because that's going to equip them for future decks when you're not around to kind of help build and, and, and suggest cards. So let people have those experiences of why cards might not be as great as an otherwise better suggestion. Yeah, well, our own ego does not enter into the equation of someone else's Absolutely. enjoyment. Yeah, very much. And I, I, I and, and please don't think that like we're we're coming from this of a like this has never happened to us. We're talking about it because it probably has happened to us. I know I one hundred percent have done this before when I've been trying to explain to, to new people. I my my partner has two teenage daughters who have asked, "Oh, Matt, what's this podcast about?" So I've I tried to explain the game to them. 100% I have been biased in my explanation of what cards do. So it's it's not that we're saying, oh, the, you should never do this because we're all guilty of this as well. Yeah, Matt kept on saying that like, oh yeah, graveyards and aristocrat stuff is all like really bad. It's stupid. It's yeah, never never do that, yeah. Completely showed his bias in those. And don't oh. don't wear scarves ever because they don't even keep you warm. <gasps> How? I didn't say, you. I didn't say that. I didn't. My sartorial choices are not on trial <laughs> in this podcast. Thank you very much. Uh, Dana, kind of relating to something that you just mentioned about, uh, I forget exactly the segue. I'm completely out of segues in this podcast, apparently. But it prompted me to um, want to ask another type of question here about, do you think that a newer player's deck should be more commander-centric or commander-agnostic? Should a lot of the cards relate to Ooh. the commander being in play? Matt, I'll use your Kyler deck as an example. I think that's a very strong candidate for a deeply commander-centric deck, where if Kyler is not in play, the deck kind of falls apart. Um, which is a very eggs all in one basket. It's really exciting when it works, but it can all fall apart pretty easily mm -hmm. and a player can get maybe stuck top decking or stuff like that. Do we think that that is a good experience to go with for a new player? Or Dana, would you say that that's the kind of thing that you'd want to avoid and that you'd want the deck to function without the commander necessarily being on the battlefield? Um, I think the deck is probably, for an, in a new player's hands, they're, it's probably better served being commander agnostic mm. in terms of like power level. But I think if you are playing with them and you are going to be intentionally pulling a few punches and like not making not making the optimal play to to handicap them, it's probably a more fun experience to play with a commander centric deck for a new player. Mm. Um, so I guess it just depends on what the environment is. If it's an environment where like you are going to have a little bit of control over how the game goes and, and how badly you can limit their ability to play, um, then I think it's probably more fun to play with a deck that really revolves around that commander and really like fires in all cylinders when it's in play. Okay. I, I really actually agree with that. Yeah, just it, 
if you're if they're newer to the game, then probably giving them a deck that doesn't really need the commander is probably the right move. But if they've played a little bit of magic, maybe they played arena, but they're learning commander, then maybe, yeah, giving them a commander focused deck or maybe not focused. You, you probably don't want to give them like a Voltron deck because that still might be a little too much, but something that benefits a little bit more and kind of raises the floor that might be a better choice if they are a little familiar with magic but not commander okay i've i've kind of noticed that especially like i I noticed that new players are really excited to play the commander a lot because that's what this format is Mm -hmm. so i i struggle with the same question uh i i think generally the thing that i've come to is that if the deck is commander centric honestly this is going to be true regardless (laughs) but like especially if the deck is commander centric there is no like cap on the number of card advantage spells that you can put into that deck that will be wrong (laughs) like make sure that you never wind up with a situation where that person would get stuck top decking because that right there is really a thing that will make a person fall out of love the first or second time that they play the game is if they can't do a dang thing and even if it's overkill even if you think you're playing some of the bad card draw spells in this color combination there's no shortage of the number of them because anything that will get the player and keep the player back in the game is clutch so so clutch so so dana touched on something that i i really really like and joe you you also did too so what are some things that you would do in, when you're actually playing the game so say that they've they've built their first deck they've, they've made their own card choices everything in those first few games what would you be looking to do or not do in those games just to make sure that that experience like you said joey don't don't create bad experiences what are some things that you're looking out for in the game with those new decks? I'm not going to cast a dang smothering tither heuristic study. I'm just not. I just there's no <laughs> nothing is going to kill someone's yeah. joy in a new game than me saying repeatedly, "Do you pay the one? Do you pay the one? Do you pay the two? Like, yeah, yeah. I yeah. just they're great cards. I probably wouldn't even put those into their deck though. Like they're obnoxiously powerful, but they're also obnoxious, and I just I don't think that they create a a great first impression. That's <laughs> that's one of my first things. <laughs> that's definitely a good call. Um, I would focus on decks that are um, easy to recognize the threat based on what's happening on the board. Um, the opposite of that would be my Kettis and Krom deck, for example, mm-hmm. that tends to win out of nowhere. Kettis swings in and looks relatively innocuous, and all of a sudden everyone takes 40 because I dropped you know, multiple creature buffs and then doubled the damage and doubled the damage and copied the damage doubler or something. That would be a miserable experience for a new player because they... They'd have a tough time understanding when the game was going to end. I would want it to be very to play a deck that was very clear. This is an, this is a threat that I've just played. You need to respond to it or deal with it, or things will happen. Make it all be something that they can recognize. Um, and and if you draw that thing that like the the card, you're like, oh, I see how I can like all of a sudden do this big explosive thing. Maybe just don't do it. Like you have to pull punches sometimes against new players. And I think that's, that's yeah. there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, with, with, with not playing some things that like could create a bad playing experience. Yeah. You don't want to coddle people forever, but like first couple of games, absolutely. And, and that point right there was what I, I very much appreciate that. People talk about, oh, you shouldn't ever sandbag or you shouldn't give players wins. And we're not talking about giving people wins, but making sure that you give people an opportunity to play the game and, and get to do the thing. Mm-hmm. I remember I was playing at a shop years and years ago and, and there's a player who very obviously was, they would played maybe enough games to fill one hand. And I had a memory jar in play and they, they were stuck on three lands. They were, they, their deck was objectively like a, just a pile of draft commons and uncommon. So everything costs like seven mana. Hmm. So on their turn, I activated a memory jar just to give them a chance to draw their fourth land. And they didn't, but everybody at the table was like, why are you doing that? I'm like, cause I want this kid to be able to play the dang game. Everybody else is already on 12 mana. Let them get to participate because it, yeah, beating down on the new person just because, oh, well, they, they didn't know how to build their deck as well as I did. That's going to make somebody never want to come back to the game again. So, yeah, absolutely, Dana, what you said, maybe pull some punches when it comes to not killing their thing so they get to experience and see what it feels like and what is good about their deck. This, uh, I, I, I swear, so uh, Commander Advisor Group member Shivan Butt has actually made this point several times on his own show and online, and I swear... Any anytime that he makes the point that he wants to create an exciting game rather than always playing to his outs, and so sometimes that involves pulling a punch here and there. Mm-hmm. There are so many 
volatile reactions to his statements about that. And it's very sad to, to see those reactions because I think that creating a fun experience for everyone is a great way to make sure that a player wants to come back and see more of the game and what it can offer yeah. as opposed to always playing to your outs. And that's just, it's there, there are some folks who would prefer to win than to let everyone have fun and that sucks sometimes and yeah. I don't want to yep. linger on it because it makes me sad but it is uh, an energy that I see sometimes out there that I would like to push back against is is what I'm trying to say and if you do pull a punch on a person do not let them know oh god no <laughs> yeah make yes. them feel bad yes. about that because why would you do why like why take the the air out of them when you just you know if you let them have the moment let them have the moment if you're going to let them have it so Nidabat. I said uh, many episodes ago like build the decks that you want to lose against and Sheldon Mennery who says all the time online be the type of person that you would invite back to the pod mm -hmm. it's totally possible for you to play the game have fun and still make sure that the the other person that was new to the game had an enriched experience because of your participation and, and so maybe yeah their deck didn't cooperate but they still will say uh eh, I, I had fun playing with you so let, let, let's play again that's the ultimate goal is just create those social memorable experiences very much when my son was seven and I taught him to play basketball, I didn't block every shot he took, although I could have. <laughs> and the fact that I didn't do that is probably why at 15, he still plays <laughs> basketball with me. There you go. Uh, Matt, to circle back around to another thing that you had asked earlier, your early question about uh, stuff to create for players. Another thing that I also want to make sure this, I guess, kind of comes back to the original thing is like those exciting synergies and leaving room for discovery for that person is another important mm -hmm. component for that. It's not just like, oh, this is a cool synergy, but also like if you put stuff into a deck that will be fun when they realize it, but it also isn't super complicated <laughs> to realize it. Um, even if it's a simple synergy, the feeling that that person can have when they put those pieces together themselves is another thing that I think will really cement them into liking the game. Um, so to use an example of this, a recent challenge of stats that I had on this show was actually for Myosians with a Lazelle and Master Chef deck. And the reason that that was on my mind was because I've actually been teaching my ex-boyfriend how to play the game recently and was building this deck for him to enjoy. And I put in those Myosians and I was just like, I, I think that this would be an exciting, fun card to aim for. But I'm not going to over explain it if it does happen. And it did happen. It did get to happen where that Myosian came in with an indestructible counter on it. And then another one because of Lazel's ability giving additional counters. And not only that, in that same deck, it has two commanders. I put one of those commander storm cards, like Imperial Storm or something, which gives you additional copies for each time that you've cast your commander. Well, the deck has two commanders. Y'all, the look of delight when he discovered those synergies, that's what made him want to keep playing. Like, that's the kind of thing that is so absolutely exciting, you know? So having those pieces that someone can put together themselves is another thing that I would want to make sure to, to aim for as much as possible when creating an experience for a new person. Letting them discover something is really a joyous thing to experience. Well, and, and giving players the time in game is huge, too. Sometimes, you know, you have to draw to those cards and, and play the, the deck a few times to really see all the cards. So make sure you're not ending games too quickly. And this kind of comes back to what we talked about a minute ago is maybe pull some punches. Just don't win on turn four. That's not the, the, the new player probably has barely had a chance to really read the cards in their hand, much less do anything meaningful. So don't end the games too quickly, but also don't let them linger either. You want to have a sense of everything's moving forward. I mean, games got to end. Make sure that the, per, the, the, the action keeps moving forward, but... I mean, wait till everybody has a chance to kind of do the thing. Yeah, find that happy medium of the game didn't end too quickly, but it also didn't drag on for forever. A game full of five board wipes would not be a great cohesion point for a new person. No. But also a game that ended on turn five would not really let them live in the experience that we were all hoping to get either. It's that, right. that finding that sweet spot. And and Dana, I'll uh, bring up a point that you mentioned earlier. The way that the game ends is also going to be huge. An out of nowhere ending kind of robs them of that narrative fulfillment a little bit mm -hmm. and so an ending that feels more inevitable that you can see coming it's like ah okay like that actually at least feels right in a way as opposed to uh, I, I couldn't have done anything uh, about you know your Kedis and Krom example and that's a really great thing to pay attention to is how the game will end for sure well speaking of how things end this is probably a good time to end this podcast <laughs> I will steal this segue from Joey as well wow oh got goodness. it 
<laughs> Got him. I I can't argue with that. That's brilliant. Um, <laughs> and th- and that's that's one you can't do at the start of the show. John. You can't try to jump ahead of me on that one. Yeah. Well, <laughs> w- w- welcome to the EDH Retcast. Well, it was good talking to you all. <laughs> not a, not a good episode. <laughs> oh man, the segue, the the stealing of the segues in 2023 is maybe my favorite running bit that we've ever done. Um, I can't wait to see how this turns out as things progress. This is the where uh, I've upped the ante, so I'm kind of worried about next there week we how you guys are going to keep stealing this. But yes, absolutely, listeners, we would love to hear from you about your thoughts about teaching a new person and how to uh, get them to feel the excitement that we all feel for this game and how that goes for you. Tips and tricks are a great thing to leave in the comments below. And also don't forget to leave in the comments your thoughts about what Cryptic Command and Questing Beast do. (laughs) No cheating, all right? Wrong answers only. Uh, But yeah, let's call this episode to a close. And fellas, if our listeners want to get in touch with us on the onlines, where is it that they can find us all? Matt? So you can find me on the Twitters at Mathemus55, where I'm tweeting about how Questing Beast has trample, I think. Uh, (laughs) You can also find us at twitch.tv slash edhrec cast every wednesday evening where we're streaming games we're having guests on every single week and it's always a super fun time so make sure you tune in for that as well and dana you can find me on the twitter birds at dana roach and i'm running articles for edh rec and commander's herald and you can find all of us together at patreon.com slash edh Recast. And I'm Joey Schultz. You can find me on the online at Joseph M. Schultz, where I'll be telling Matt that uh, it doesn't have trample. It clearly has flying, right? Uh, you can sure. also find the cast at EDH Retcast on the Facebooks and the Twitters. And if you have a question for us, you can contact us at EDH Retcast at gmail.com. Our thanks go out once again to Chase for assisting me with the post production of the show and who definitely knows all the text to Questing Beast, no doubt. You can find them online at Mana Curves. Listeners, we'll be back at you next week with more data and insights. But until then, remember EDH wreck your deck before you wreck your deck. Ah!